Hey guys, uh, it's time for another episode of Grant Draws. Uh, tonight we have a guest on the show uh, named Robert Norton. He has one of my favorite YouTube shows right now. Um, uh, I guess I can, I, I think we might have to have you on again some night because I have a lot of questions that I want to ask you, but I feel like probably the majority of the show is going to get caught up talking about um, the tragic news that we had t today. Um, sorry. So hi, Robert. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Thanks for having me on. I, I am absolutely interested. We can get together again in a later time if we, we'd like where we can talk shop outside of this unfortunate situation of the day. But yeah, we, we will definitely do that. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think I talked about it a little bit last week. Okay. Um, before we go too far, I do want to mention the people who are in the chat. Uh, Dan Holifield, always nice to see you. My friend Donna and Carl, like I said, um, I actually bought a couple books that, that Donna and Carl wrote. Donna and Carl are, are a, uh, a married couple and they're, they're really great people. They're really nice folks to know. So um, I am going to mention that the show is sponsored by the Independent Creator Directory. Uh, Joe, I hope you understand if I if I don't go into the full sales pitch of it tonight. It's um, it's a pretty somber night, at least for us. And um, our friend Don who also is always a ray of sunshine. Um, anybody else I missed? Foxy. Foxy, nice to see you. I, I think this is the first time you've watched my show. I know that I've been in the chat with you with other shows, but it's uh, nice that you're watching the show. Uh, Angie Angie uh, is my wife. Um, she, she comes with me to uh, conventions a lot and to some of the stores. I can't remember if she ever ended up um, meeting Ed Piscor or not. Um, I mean, I only met Ed briefly. Um, I hope you don't mind if I if I go on for a little bit and talk about uh, kind of what Ed's art and uh, what Cartoonist Kayfabe meant to me, Robert. And then obviously I'll yep. let you kind of go on. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I just don't want to step on your toes while you're going into your, your stuff, but I would love to hear this story. Yeah, please do. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> so I started watching this YouTube channel. Um, it's called Cartoonist Kayfabe, um, and it was it, it, it became very clear to me that it was kind of light years ahead of, of the other comic book YouTube channels. For those of you who don't know what Cartoonist Kayfabe was, it was – it was kind of like a director's commentary, but for, for comic books. It was two super, super smart guys who just knew comic books like the back of their hand. Like, it didn't matter if you were talking like cheesy image crap from the 90s or if you were talking about like Dick Tracy cartoon <coughs> from the, the 40s. Uh, or if you were talking like about like super underground, like Robert Crumb, uh, stuff like that, they just knew the amount of knowledge they had was just inconceivable to me. Um, so during one episode, uh, Ed's partner, Jim Rugg, mentioned that he went to IUP which is the small, which is the college in the small town that I grew up in. So by the way, I, I started watching the, these shows, not realizing that they were from Pittsburgh. Um, and you know, I, I just, I became huge fans of theirs through that. Um, and you know, when I found out that Jim Rugg went to IUP, I immediately, you know, looked up his email address, emailed him and said, Hey, did you ever go to Patty's Paperbacks and Comics, which is the comic book store I grew up going to? 
And almost immediately, I got an email back from Jim Rugg with a list of all like the influential comic books that he bought at Patty's Paperbacks and Comics, um, which was so cool. I mean, that was a bonding moment. Like when I would see him at stores or uh, uh, or conventions or, you know, if there was like a swap meet in Pittsburgh, I would always say, hey, Jim, you remember me? I'm the, the guy who went to Patty's Paperbacks and Comics. Um, and who knows if he actually remembered me or not, but, you know, he would always like smile and, uh, you know, say that he remembered me. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to have to bring up the elephant in the room. Um, so, so, so the other creator was named Ed Piscor, um, phenomenally talented guy, um, I'm going to be honest, the, the, the comics him, him themselves, I was not as big a fan of as I was, you know, the commentary. Yeah, I agree. I'm the same way. Um, and, and, and to be honest with you, there was stuff on Cartoonist Kayfabe that I vehemently disagreed with. Um, but I still really loved the show. Um, so about, it's been what, a week, a week ago, Friday, I think allegations came up that, um, Ed Piscor was saying inappropriate things to an underage girl online. Um, like four years ago. Right. Um, and I mean, I don't. I don't know how much I want to get in. I, I think I, so you and I are on the same Facebook group and I, and I was pretty vocal about like, Hey guys, I, this is getting, whether or not Ed did something terrible, this is starting to turn into a lynch mob. Yeah. hundred percent. Which, which it definitely did turn into a lynch mob. Um, uh, suffice it to say, um, earlier today he posted something on his Facebook page that um, there's really no other way to interpret it other than a suicide note. And um, I mean, even at that point, I still thought, you know, I know a lot of his friends and family, you know, called the police. I know people were, were going to his house, like being like, Ed, you don't have to do this. Um, but, um, you know, he did. Yeah. Um, and I, so I shared, I, I saved some photos on my computer. Um, let me bring them up for you. Um, Here we go. Okay, so this is what uh, he looked like. Um, I feel like this photo is a pretty good representation of him. He was, you know, a nerdy hip hop fan. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, what I like about that picture is like the persona he put on cartoonist kayfabe, the hat and the glasses. It was almost like this is going to sound stupid, but almost like a superhero costume. It was like a, like a, like a, right. a, a vibe that he put out with his look. This picture just looks like just a guy just like the normal human him just the the human guy himself yeah that, i mean i think that a lot of people had trouble kind of figuring i mean the name of the channel was cartoonist kayfabe for those of you who don't know i mean kayfabe is a wrestling term which means like the phony parts of wrestling so it was always kind of hard to figure out where ed piscor the persona started and where ed piscor the person started right um and just for the record like i mean i i've been to the neighborhood that ed grew up in he was not exaggerating it 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 was as rough as he he said it was so i mean i i definitely think this this latest incident definitely contributed to you know him him ending his life but I think 
in most cases, you can't necessarily say one thing led. I, I, I feel like he had a lot of, of, of um, mental health problems even before this ha- happened. Yeah, I, I I wondered about that, but I just I kind of my thoughts on it were that he he built up through so much time and effort, personal and professional respect that he worked his butt off to make, and it was taken from him in an instant, and it's just got to be devastating. Yeah, I mean, and and I mean, he let he lived for comic books. Yes, uh, I mean, I mean that's what he did. 12, 14 hours a day, it, it, it was comic books. Um, so now this this image, I would say this is maybe a little bit closer to his persona, where he's got like, you know, the sunglasses and, and the hat pulled down and like the big heavy overcoat. Um, and I feel like as the show went on, I, I, I feel like this kind of persona kind of like was starting to take over. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I it's it's hard to know maybe he's just getting more and more comfortable with himself and who he was, or I don't, like you said, it's hard to know if there was how much of it was an act. You know, I feel like he wanted to, I coming from like a, a hip hop kind of background and a rough neighborhood. I feel like growing up in that kind of world, you do have to kind of put up kind of a, a front to the society at this rough world you're growing up in. But normal him is probably just kind of a quiet kind of introverted nerd, but he's got to put up this kind of persona to kind of project some strength and maybe that just kind of followed him into his, you know, his, his, his persona on the channel. If that, if that makes any sense. Yeah. I think you might have a point there. Um, so this is, this is actually one of my favorite images that he did. This is uh, a series of self portraits. And this kind of alludes to the fact that there, you know, there was more than one, side to his personality. Yeah. You know, I've seen that picture before, but I never like looked into see to what it was. And now that you say it's, it's, it's a bunch of different versions of himself. Now I look at it, I can totally see it, but I never made that connection before. And also, I mean, he, he's just a really great draftsman. Yeah. Um, So he was working on this, which is was a daily comic strip uh, called the Switchblade Shorties. Um, I mean, one of the things that he alluded to in the um, the suicide note was that he had a massive uh, book deal uh, to reproduce these these comic strips, and um, that was kind of taken off the table after um the allegations i don't i don't know i don't i can't decide if i want i don't know how much i want to get into you know the right or wrong of of um you know cancel culture or whatever you want to call it right I, i i don't know if that's appropriate to talk about today i mean i know a lot of people are talking about that but um I don't know. It's a frustrating topic for sure. It's, it's aggravating to me. And so this is a um, kind of a collage that he did in his hip hop family tree. I'm going to be honest with you. I re- I know little or, or nothing about hip hop. So, <laughs> <Me too>. um, <laughs> so I, I mean, that kind of goes back to what I was saying about, um, Ed was always kind of an artist that I respected kind of more than, than having like an emotional attachment to. Uh, and I mean, I think a lot of that was just the fact that he picked subject matter that I uh, wouldn't necessarily have been my choice to, to read. You know what I mean? Yeah. Agreed. Um, and yeah, the thing that I really liked about his art is, uh, I mean, I don't know if I can articulate this well, but the if you can make things look rough while also make it looking very precise. Um, That's which, a fair 
assessment. I like that. I, I, I think that's a good assessment. Which I think this, this illustration really, uh, unfortunately, I can't really zoom in too much or it starts to get pixelated. But um, yeah, he was just, I mean, I don't, I wish I had more to say than just like, wow, look at what a, what a hell of a, dra a draftsman. Um, and then these are, of course, from the stuff he did at Marvel. He did a, um, a comic book called X-Men Grand Design, which was basically the history of the X-Men. Um, and yeah, um, I mean, I think he was one of the few guys who could do like the truly independent comic books, but then also just, you know, throw out something for Marvel. You know what I mean? Well, he seemed to have a way of any project that he picked to do. There was that WYSIWYG and then Hip Hop Family Tree and then X-Men Grand Design and then Red Room. And then everything he did was successful and got more successful as he went on. Like, even if people didn't, some people didn't like the subject, you couldn't deny the fact that it was being successful. It was making him money and they were continued to do it. I mean, even the Grand Design comic brand went on to two other people. You know, there's a, what, Fantastic Four and a Hulk right. Grand Design. So it's yeah. like it created like a mini brand that he kind of started. So he, he, like you said, he can jump around from different subject matter to different subject matter and make it work. I mean, it was pretty amazing. Like, like I mean, obviously he did the X Men Grand Design, and obviously X Men is is a known commodity. But I mean, there aren't very many creators now where it's like, like, oh, Ed Pisker has a new book out. Let's let's check it out. It's not, you know, what's the new X Men comic book? It's you know, what's the new Ed Pisker comic book? Right, where it's just the name of the creative, not the not the corporate brand that you're interested in. So I think if I'm not wrong, you are drawing a character from Red Room. Yeah. Yeah. It was always an interesting design and I figured that would be a, um, I got the little reference right here. I can't remember what the character's name is. I'm trying to see if it says, but um, just some weird, female design cre like i want to say creature it's not a creature but uh whatever it was i mean i, I did read these books but I, they weren't quite my cup of tea yeah but um i i it's like one of those things where i could tell it was well made even if i'm not particularly enjoying it myself right um don wanted to say the the rainy weather is kicking my butt today my heart goes out to you grant robert hope everyone has a peaceful evening um yeah, so I've kind of like, thank you, Don. I appreciate it. Have a great night. Um, so I've kind of rattled on. Did you um, did you kind of want to talk at all about how you found out about uh, Ed's comics? How um, kind of like, I don't know if you discovered the YouTube channel first or 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 what? Well, for me, um, I was on a... a internet forums uh, a website digital webbing i don't know if you've heard of that i haven't but um it was a it was a pretty i want to say popular place there's been some um working professionals these days that were found through that website like ryan otley who oh. does invincible um he was kind of found through that type of a place and um but there's just different forums and somebody posted up and just like creator community something like that it was just like hey for anybody who's interested there's this channel on youtube these guys are going over wizard magazine page by page it's pretty interesting i'm like oh all right that sounds great because wizard magazine was a big deal for me back in the day I it think was the wizard videos were the first ones i watched too yeah and um wizard for me like there were some days we're going to buy comics it was like the greatest day because i'd find 10 books of stuff i couldn't wait to read you know um, here's the new image comic. Here's the new X-Men. Here's the new, whatever, whatever. But then also the best days, there was also a new issue of wizard and that would be at the top of the list. I want to read wizard first before I read the comic. So to hear these guys, go, a, a subscription, what's that? Did you ever have a subscription? 
Nope, I just would go to the local comic shop in the small town. It was just like yeah, then I might be nerdier than you because I I totally had a subscription. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I never had enough money to get a subscription. I was lucky to scrape up enough money to buy the books that I wanted. My my parents, who were super poor at the time, um, did the their best to because they're like it for them. Comics were a very cheap thing to let their kids have. You know, they couldn't afford to buy me video games or right and be on trips but comic books especially at the time were very inexpensive and they're like this makes you happy okay we'll do that so i would go every week every wednesday that i could to the this drugstore down the road and when there was a wizard there that was that was great and so to hear these guys going over it but then what i was most interested in that caught me first is that how they would talk about it and how, as working professionals who've been in the industry, they talk about how kind of crap the magazine became in its later years, which I agree with. It wasn't about comics. It was about pop culture, and it lost its shine. But to start, it was a great and only place to get real comics information. So that's how I found their channel. And um, and then once they started digging into other just random comic books, I'm like, oh, I've got that one. And just I'm hooked from then on out, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I should have gotten into that. Like part of the thing that that really appealed to me about it was they were going issue by issue through Wizard Magazine, which uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Wizard Magazine was a huge comic book magazine uh, back in the 90s, which I, I'm assuming that you're about the same age as I am, Robert. I was, I was born, I'm sorry. What did you say? I was born in 1977. Oh, okay. So I, I was born in 1980. So um, the early 90s was kind of a formative time for comic books. And I think one of the things that I find entertaining about uh, watching your show is I think you kind of have the same opinion that I do, which is that the 90s, I, I, I still like the, the nostalgia of the 90s while recognizing that the comic books were, were mostly pretty terrible. Yeah, there was a lot of junk, but it was sure fun to a kid at the time. Yeah, I mean, I I do sometimes sit down and, and read, um, or at least look back through some of those older comic books, and I do wonder what it was that I loved so much about them. But, <laughs> I think uh, we all do. <laughs> It was a really bizarre time for comic books. I mean, I, I know there, a lot has been made about like, oh, um, you know, the 90s were the speculator boom. But I don't know about you. I, I mean, I never bought comic books thinking, oh, they're going to go up in value. I bought I bought comic books because I loved them. That was me. I mean, there was I, you couldn't help it as a young kid, in my opinion, think like, well, maybe this will be worth something maybe but i was really kind of indifferent to that like i didn't care i wanted to read something that was entertaining and i took care of my books but not because i was worried about their financial value but because i liked them and i did not want them ruined so i took good care of them right so okay so so you bought um red room did you buy any of ed's other comic books uh, I mean, I, I've never gone back to seek, seek out his um, older works. Uh, I'm kind of interested in the hip hop family tree, but it's kind of in the big omnibuses that are very expensive. And I don't know. I, I it's like I want to get one, but it's it's kind of it's hip hop isn't anything I'm particularly interested in. And do I want to spend that kind of money on a giant book? And the one thing I came really close to doing is once all this stuff went came out about Ed, a bunch of troll idiots online were like i can't own his work anymore who wants to buy my stuff yeah you know and i almost like hit a guy up like well send me your hip-hop family tree uh, that's the one i'm kind of most interested in um i was reading his switchblade shorties online and it wasn't quite appealing to me in the way that i hoped it would but you know i i started reading uh switchblade shorties and it wasn't anything against the 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 strip itself it was more to me reading one comic strip at a time on instagram is a really unpleasant way to try to read a comic book uh, i 
reading comics digitally. Okay. I just, I don't like reading them, but I, I what, what got me excited about his work is when he'd show the pages on his channel and show the original black and white work. I'm like, God, it looks good. But then he was releasing them with this kind of like color overlay over the whole thing. So it's not black and white. It's like a blue. And then some of the dialogue of the kids, the way they were speaking kind of just rubbed me the wrong way. I'm like, Ugh, it's, I can see the skill in it, but I was like, I think this is another one that's not for me. I wanted to be into it, but it wasn't quite, you know, giving me what I wanted. Uh, if I could ever find the X-Men Grand Designs for a good price, I'm definitely interested in those. Okay, yeah, I have the X-Men Grand Design, and those were the books that of his that I really enjoyed, even though, I mean, I know a lot of the, the criticism of that was like, oh, he's just taking other people's stories and recontextualizing them but i mean he was good at that so i mean that's the point of the thing to tell the entire story so you could pick up the books and get the story of the x-men in just a couple of big volumes broken down into a digestible chunk rather than picking up 300 or whatever potential comics that you would need to find to get the whole story exactly i feel like he took from what i understand took the important parts and left out some of the more nonsensical stuff to give you the best parts of it. Like, I think he was talking about how he was getting into having Psylocke in there. And he's like, there was this whole thing where she was a British person and then her body was changed. He's like, I just ignored all of that. I just like, she was a British or she was like a Japanese assassin, something that something to that effect. I'm like, that makes sense. It's, that's all you really need to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had the X-Men Grant design. I was I was hoping he was going to do another book signing so that, you know, obviously I could take that and get it autographed. But, I mean, obviously that's not going to happen now. Um, oh, you know, I never – I mean, I guess I don't know that I really have necessarily a story about how I met, met Ed. It was just like, um, you know, you would see him – like he was never calling attention to himself, you know, at, at these stores. He would just sit and or stand and and go through the long boxes for like hours at a time. And um, it, I mean, it was cool. You could go up and say hi to him. And I mean, like we said, his 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 on screen persona came off as maybe like the kind of guy that you wouldn't necessarily want to bother <laughs> um, but uh, he was actually quite approachable whenever i i met him um, i see that i mean if you're if you're kind of respectful respectful to him and respectful of his time and space but wanted to throw out like a hey you know i'm a fan of this that and the other i can i can see him being like a cordial kind of fun guy i i believe that totally yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of just cool having like a legitimate, you know, big name comic book creator here in Pittsburgh because I mean, it was like you know every every comic book store you went into, like the owner had a story about oh you know yeah Ed Piscor stopped in last week and he said this 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 and this or you know Jim Rugg or or Tom Scioli. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think this something else that was like a lot of the appeal of Cartoonist Kayfabe was uh, the chemistry that especially Tom and Jim had, but in, in to a lesser degree, I would say Tom Scioli, who was an occasional guest on. Right, show. right. But um, I mean, it really broke my heart. And please don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm I'm not I'm I'm not saying you know Jim did anything wrong, but I mean it really broke my heart when when Jim put out that that message that just said like you know I can't associate with with Ed professionally anymore because it it was kind of, I kind of almost think of of Jim and Ed as being like the ideal heterosexual male friendship. I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> like the way they talked, I don't know if you saw the video of, of 
somebody posted it on the Facebook group where they were walking through um, the new dimension, uh, the new dimension comics warehouse, which new yeah. dimension is like, it, it's a borderline chain uh, comic book shop here in Pittsburgh. Like they have like five or six different locations. And I guess they have one, one like kind of, um, universally located like warehouse where where they draw um like back issues from and and jim was like oh my god ed is gonna lose his mind when he walks in there and i <laughs> and i remember seeing that video thinking like oh man those guys really loved each other i agree i felt they were homies they were really good pals and um uh, I, I didn't i didn't mean to cut you off but i do have a, an opinion a pure conjecture about that um, post that Jim Rugg made. I can't help but wonder what kind of conversations that those guys have to have with each other. You know, I think we all were like, what did they, what did Jim have to say to him? Or what did Ed, had, like, did this come up? Did you really do this? What's the, what's the real story? Like, because you're being canceled and, and it's going to take me down with you. So I need to know what really happened. Um, I can imagine a scenario where Ed saw himself going down and he tells his best friend, Jim, go disavow me, go right. walk away, save your own career, save face. Don't worry about me. Who knows? Maybe Ed at that point knew what he was going to do. And just, but I can, I can, I can imagine a scenario where uh, Ed told Jim, just go, just go separate yourself from me as much as you can and go save yourself save your career and your reputation. Don't worry about me. And I'd like to think that that is the case rather than Jim just being like, oh, I'm so mad at my homie. I gotta, I'm going to throw him under the proverbial bus, which I don't believe he would do. I mean, the other thing that, that's, I mean, a lot of people have mentioned this online. If um, you notice that he says, I'm ending my professional career with or my professional relationship with with ed yeah. never said my my personal right relationship yep um, so uh and, and i mean and in the suicide note i don't know if you read it but uh um, oh, several times i mean ed did say that he came over to his house and gave him a big hug yeah is that I, i'm not gonna lie being completely real that moved me to tears yeah it's just like my homie came over, gave me a hug and told me he loved me is what he said. And I'm like, that reinforces what I feel. I don't feel like Jim like turned his back on him and was like, oh, hell with this guy, you know, which some people are kind of throwing rugs, some shade for that. Like he was never really a true fan. Um, I don't believe that. I'm again, who knows? But I don't think. I mean, that. I'm, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think at some point. I mean, Jim had to say, I mean, this is my livelihood. I, I can't, I can't like go down with a ship. Um, at least in my opinion, I, I certainly would not expect any of my friends to say, oh, I'm going to sacrifice my professional career just, you know, right. In terms of, of being friends with you. But, um, uh, yeah, I, it was, I, yeah, I've, I mean, I don't know what went on in that room. I mean, my thing is like, I can't even imagine like seeing Jim get, get mad. Like, I mean, I, mean, I can't, I mean, he just comes across as such a nice guy. I can't even picture yeah. that, like, like yeah. playing at somebody. Yep. Yeah, I agree. Did you catch the part in that note that Ed left where um, he was talking about putting his will together? And then yeah. he's he's saying to Jim, he's like, that paper that I was brushing aside that you were asking about, and I, 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 I kind of dismissed it. That was actually my will. It's like Ed knew what he was going to do, but he was keeping it a secret from his buddy, probably telling him, go save your own career. And I bet Jim is just dying inside knowing like if ed would have just told me i would have been there for him you know 
I mean, I, I can't imagine what any any of these guys are, are going through. I mean, but especially, I can't imagine what what Jim is going through. Um, like, especially knowing, like, he's sitting there working on his will. Oh, God, that's got to be rough. I, I can't even imagine the mindset it, it takes to be like, I know what I'm going to do. And so I'm going to get my affairs in order. My, uh, my ex-wife, she works for the suicide prevention team for the VA, for veterans. And when we were married, she would talk to me all the time about people who decide to do what he did. Like they're down in the dumps. You sometimes, most of the time you can kind of, you know, that someone's having a rough time, but she said, but suddenly they seem happy. Suddenly they come in and you see them and everything's kind of fine and they're laughing and they're having a good time. And then suddenly one day they're just gone. And you're like, why the hell? What they were doing fine. And she's saying what they do is that they finally decided to go to that extreme. They've just decided to do it. And so now nothing else matters. All the weight of the universe is gone. I don't have to worry about my job, my career, my family. My f- I don't have to worry about any of it because I know what I'm going to do. And so That's- yeah, I mean, Ed said in in the the suicide note, this is the first time all week that I've I've felt like you know my head was clear, right? Because he decided what he was going to do, and that's just it's so sad, you know. And I bet maybe he was talking to his boy Jimmy. He was like, you know, things will be all right. And maybe Jim was like, all right, maybe we'll find a way out of this. I don't know. And then, guess what? It's where we're at. I mean, I, even after he posted that note, I still thought, you know, okay, maybe he's just doing this. Maybe this is just a cry for help. I don't know. Um, I, I remember I kept I kept refreshing. Um, like I had Ed Piscor News on Google, and I kept refreshing like all day, like yep. see somebody – Please tell me, you know, the police got to him and, and, uh, you know, maybe he was on the verge of doing something, but at the, you know, the cops came in right as he was about to do something, but. Well, I had some people kind of suggest like they, he had his phone charged and he had it on and gave out his number. Some people were like, he wants to be caught before he does something. And I was like, I hope that's true. But also I'm like, Ed Piscor doesn't seem like the kind of guy to me that's going to, he suffers no fools. He's going to, he's going to do what he's going to do and he's going to follow through. And it seems like that's the case. But some people were thinking, well, maybe because he gave out his phone number, he was hoping somebody would find him. Just like you're kind of saying. I mean, and- the really sad thing is a lot of people die, you know, trying to do like a cry for help. Yeah. I mean, a lot. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I've heard people, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've heard people speculate that uh, Sylvia Platt, like she knew that her husband was going to come through the door, like right as she stuck her head in the oven. But for some reason, he got stuck in traffic or something. I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, who knows? Um, like, like I said, I was hoping this was this was all going to be you know a cry for attention or or maybe a cry for sympathy i don't i don't know um the the other thing that i just can't get over is like all that knowledge like i i alluded to it it to to it earlier just like it's almost like you could throw a dart at like a history of comic books and you know ed could go on for an hour about it and and yep. all of that is gone now. Yeah. The wealth of knowledge that he has and the information he could have shared and taught. You know, yeah. It's just it's just gone. You know what I mean? The only I'm trying to find like a ray of sunshine is that so much of his knowledge is forever preserved on a YouTube channel. There's videos of it where you can hear him talk about stuff. Hundreds of hours. Assuming they keep it up, which I would guess that they oh. will. And my understanding is, is that they've got a whole shit ton of um, videos 
that they've never released yet. I understand they've got a big backlog of stuff just waiting to go. So there's still unseen stuff. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? Do you, he's gone. Is it, is it appropriate to show his face on the channel? I mean, he's, he said in his, in his will, or I'm sorry, in his, in his suicide note, um, like he wants, he wants that to be his legacy. So, yeah. I mean, I would certainly hope that nobody's going to take that down. Well, I mean, you know, Jim Rugg owns it now. He was saying that it's a, it's a LLC. It's their thing. And he told them, keep it going, show our stuff. He said, release those videos that our patrons would get to see where they'd get to sit in on the recording sessions and just, He's like, that's how, how I want people to remember me. Just a nerd who sat down and loved to talk comic books. And uh, I think that's a great idea. But it's also going to be kind of hard to watch knowing that everything went the way it did. But I, w I would want to see it. I'd rather see it and be sad than never get to experience it. Yeah, I mean, I've tried watching a few Cartoonist Cafe videos um, since this all happened. I mean, not not necessarily today, but since last Friday, and um, yeah, it, it it is really it's really sad. Yeah, agreed. Um, this drawing you're doing is starting to look really cool, though. Well, thanks. I've uh, never drawn this character before, and sometimes drawing leathery textures is tricky. So I'm, it's, well, that's cool about it. Uh, some uh, some experimentation on my part to see if it kind of works, and I'm not hating it, so that's a that's a good you know that's a good sign. So now, do you think like was was um, cartoonist kayfabe was it an influence on you in terms of starting your your YouTube channel because it, you do have sort of a similar format. Uh. I would say yes. Uh, I was watching their stuff, and part of me was like, well, I can't do this. These guys are doing it. I'm never going to be a fraction as knowledgeable as they are. But I, eventually, I just kind of – i it's so weird because I've been doing it for just over a year now. And I struggle to think of what my mindset was just before I started, like the details. of Like, why did I want to do this? What was I really thinking? Because it's kind of taken over so much of my life because it's become more successful than I ever thought. I'm like, I just, I think I wanted just to try it, just to talk about things and see if I could do it. I've never been one to stand in front of people and talk or give speeches. And I'm like, I can't do this. But I'm, I was like, just who cares? Let's just do it. And I don't know if you watched any of my, the live streams I've done or all my videos, but there's that friend of mine, Jessica, who yeah. joined me. She had encouraged me to do something similar to this. I, I think I've kind of mentioned it. She's like, oh my God, you should totally do that. So she was a positive kind of influence on me to give it a shot. And, but then I, I can tell that having listened to so much of the cartoonist kayfabe stuff, it helped guide my way of talking about things and things that they had talked about, I'd never known about. And now I see it in books that I'm going over. So it was definitely like a, like a training ground, just listening to them to kind of, here's how you can kind of do it. And here's how to talk about things. And so, yeah, it was definitely an influence on me for sure. Yeah. I remember it just like, like, you know, offhanded remarks that they would make throughout an episode, like thinking like, man, that is such great advice. You know, I would have to spend, you know, I, I mean, I've, I've bought entire books full of, of, you know, tips on how to make comic books that don't have as much, you know, good information as this one video. Right. Watched. Um, just little things like, uh, I remember one time, like during an episode, Ed was talking about like, look at how tight the word balloon is around the text here. And that, like, I mean that, and that was like something that I would, would never even think to like, to like look at in a comic book. And I remember I was about halfway through lettering the, fir the first issue of my comic book, Beowulf. And I remember like going back and like re-lettering it after that comment. That's awesome that you mentioned that because one of the biggest takeaways for me 
has been their discussions on lettering. And I've realized like it's the last thing I've ever paid any attention to in terms of learning how to do a thing. I hate writing. I don't like lettering. And to hear these guys like the only way you can make it look really, truly, honestly, the best version of itself is to do it by hand. And that sounds like the worst kind of torture to me is lettering a comic by hand. I just want to die. But I didn't pay attention to how important lettering was. It, to me, it was it was irrelevant. It was an, an innocuous thing. But once they started pointing out, look how this sound effect works here. Look how the bubbles are placed correctly, how the lettering works, how the, the spacing is a certain way. And so I started going like, oh, like, and is, as dumb as this might sound, I was like, if I were to ever show them my work, the thing that they would dislike the most, they'd be like, you did a bullshit fake computer lettering program, didn't you? That ruins it. And I was like, oh, darn. So I'm going to be honest with you. I still think that they're crazy for, for sitting there and and lettering by hand. Um, I mean, I, it, for me, it, it maybe makes the lettering look 5% better but it's 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 10 times as much work yeah but i think that just goes to show their level of dedication to the craft they're like i want that five percent i I want that that true authentic lettering on the board that is their handwriting and they can control it a hundred percent well not only that like i mean like to to not only you know insist on hand lettering but to you know not you know, not even hire a letterer, but to sit there and do it yourself. Oh my God. Just Yeah. It makes me go like, I know that that's something I will never, I, I still have no interest in, even though I know how important it is now, I'm still not going to ever do it by hand, but it does make me look at how I do it. When I do finally put the words on my own books, I'm like, all right, I better make it not offensive. At least, at least, you know, I better make it look at least passable. And if I'm lucky. So yeah, that the lettering element of it really is something that really jumped out to me as like, uh, I can't dismiss this as much as I have been. So, okay. So you mentioned like, if you ever gave these guys uh, any of your comic books, so there, so I actually did, um, you know, whenever I would see them at like a swap meet or something, if I had a copy of my comic book, I would always hand, you know, I would hand them a copy. And uh, at, at some point on, in one of their videos, I can't remember why, but one of the characters, like one of the characters in the comic book that they were going over was throwing a book into the garbage. And, and he goes, and one of them said, oh, this is like when you get free comic books at a convention, like, from, <laughs> you know. And and like I remember hearing that and like I was like oh does that mean my my comic book went straight into the garbage oh yeah I can see I can imagine these guys getting tons of stuff sent to them all the time and they're just buried under stuff and they're yeah, like exactly. and I also kind of understood and respected the idea that they have a voice and they can make a career if they put your book on the channel, they can make you a comic book career. And I feel like there's probably an element that we don't see where everyone's up their butts about, Hey, show my book, make me a career, please. And if, unless your stuff is absolutely magical, they got other stuff they'd rather do. But like that, uh, Kurt Burdick and his death of power. Yeah. You know, they made his career. Yeah. And I love that guy's stuff. It's so warped and twisted and weird. And I absolutely love it. But he's having successful crowdfundings every time. He's coming out with book four. He made his career. And I just think everyone wanted to get their approval on it. Like, yeah, so, I mean, I, I would give them my comic books, but I never pushed that. Um, yeah, I, I always felt uncomfortable. I did know other comic book creators uh, my wife, Angie, probably knows exactly who I'm talking about. Who, uh, there was another uh, comic book creator who would always try to push, like, you know, we should do, you know, we should do, uh, what do they got, call it, cross promotion. And I'm, like, s- sitting there thinking, like, uh, okay, like, why would these guys who sell tens of thousands of comic books cross promote with, with somebody who sells, like, 500 com- comics, you know? Sure. But, but um, 
So I never tried to press that. So um, my, I did want to mention my wife just said she loves your style. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. I, I appreciate that. So I don't know if you, uh, so, I mean, I try to keep these shows to about an hour. I don't know if you want to talk at all about, about um, the comic book that you do. Um, my, my silly thing. <laughs> um, hold on. Let me slide over just two seconds and grab the stack right over here. Here we go. So this is the thing where everyone kind of looks at me and goes, you're doing what? I'm like, well, I, I, I don't know what to say. For the last several years, I've been working on a He-Man, a Masters of the Universe fan comic. So yeah. nothing I can sell to anybody. Um, I do get them in people's hands for, we'll call it a donation to the channel. But um it's nothing I can do anything with, but I just had this story that come up in my head a couple of years ago when my younger brother for my birthday bought me the DVDs of the old 80s cartoon, which I used to watch as a kid, and I loved it so much. And um, I'd watch it, and I'm like, the animation's great, the character designs are great. Man, these stories are for children. Right. And so I started coming up with like a more adult version of these stories that adult me would want to see as opposed to kid me. And so I just started coming up with stories. And so these are volumes one through five. As you can see, I've got five books and each one is like 80 pages minimum. Book five that I just did is like 120 of this story that I'm working on. So that's book one right there, cover to book two. And then there's book three. And if you know your 80s lore, you can see that I had some crossover with some other's character. And then books one through three were kind of one complete story. And then I kept going into book four and five. This is book four there. Got a back cover on it. A friend of mine art modeled for this. That was fun. And then uh, that, so yeah, that's, that's volume four. And then this is volume five, the one I just finished most recently. And I am currently maybe about halfway done with volume six, which will wrap up everything. And it's going to be at this point, the greatest thing I've ever made. I've got a big complete story that I can hand to people and be like, here's something I wrote and drew and, and directed the story in the way that I wanted to and told the things I wanted to in the way that I like to. And once I'm done with this, I've got some creator owned stuff that I'm going to pursue now that I've got a YouTube channel and a little bit of an audience. Maybe I can, crowdfund a thing who knows there's some possibilities but this is the thing that i've been working on for the last couple of years as weird as it is like i'm doing a masters of the universe fan comic yeah i mean i i guess the thing that blows me away is just the the sheer amount of work you put into something that um like you don't own the rights to you know? yeah which and, I, and i think i've told you this before like at least during your live streams, I, I can't decide if this is crazy or if it's admirable. Like, <laughs> put all this work into, I mean, I mean, on some level, it's it's very admirable that you're putting all this work, and it looks great, by the way. Thank you. But you're, you, you know, you're putting all this work into something that you can't monetize, which, I mean, I guess, I mean, I guess that's maybe one of the problems with the American way of thinking is that we think we have to monetize everything. I mean, you're clearly doing this for the love of it. I mean, it would be nice to be putting all this time and effort into it and be able to make some money off it so I can continue doing it even full time would be the ideal situation. But you're right. I just I had this story that was in my head and I kept thinking about it. I'm like, gosh, this would be so interesting. Like, it's a story that I would want to read. I want to read it. And I was like, I've had stories like that as a comic creator all my life, I've got a billion stories and a billion characters and, and concepts that I've come up with. And I'm like, I've never wheeled one of them into existence. Not once. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make this one real. I'm going to make it where people can read it. We I'm not going to. Very real. Craft. Six different volumes. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's going to be a giant story that someone can read. And it's, I also consider it like a training ground. This is how I practice and get better. I just draw page after page after page. And the idea is that I get better and 
hopefully by the time I get to a point, which hopefully will be in the next year or so, where I can, I'm going to try and do a creator own thing with some crowdfunding, people will be interested enough. You know, I've got a little bit of an audience, maybe I'm at a skill level where people will want to buy it. And, but it's just training. And plus I'm super happy with, I'm proud of it. Like, I think there's something interesting here and it's, I don't, I'm not trying to like be egotistical about it, but if you can't advocate for your own work, if you can't tell people, I think it's interesting, you should try it. If you're just like, nah, it sucks. You don't want to read it. Well, then why does anybody else want to, you know, I think I made something that's kind of interesting and I've had nothing but mostly positive feedback. So and I'm glad to be approaching the end of it. So it, it'll be done, but I'll have this great big volume of stuff that people can read. So that's what I'm doing. That's my work. So, I mean, I think, and I, I think I asked you this once before, what was, but I, I can't remember, you know, there, there've been other comic books, like, I mean, for instance, like Supreme was obviously Alan Moore trying to do Superman. Did right. you ever think about doing something like that? Well, ironically, so when the story's done, my plan is when the story's done, there's going to be certain characters that made it to the end and certain ones that didn't, but there's going to be a core group of four of them that are kind of like a team. And I've got this concept in mind that it it's kind of hard to explain, but basically it's going to be like, A couple of years after the end of my He-Man fan comic, this group of characters that went off and did adventures, they were going through a magical portal that that ended up sending them to an alternate dimension and popped them out onto an alternate world, changed in form and uh, in body and mind a little bit. Kind of like, I don't know if you read X-Men and like the uh, Siege Perilous in the X-Men stories where a lot of the X-Men went through this thing and they re-emerged as like different versions of themselves. It's so, it's basically going to be like these characters, but designed differently that they're mine. But if you read the He-Man comic, you know that it's a continuation of that story. And they're going to be like, we're on a different world where this is not home. Well, I'm never going to say home is Eternia, but that's what it is. But it's also a new fresh take to go off into their own direction and have their own adventures. And in my head, it works. Whether I can wheel that into reality in a way that other people would be interested in, we'll see. But that's kind of my idea, is to take and do alternate versions of them in a, in a different world that's like, this is She-Ra, but she's got black hair and a different outfit. And, you know, I'll make her a little different, but it's, it's essentially a continuation, but something I can make into my own. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, it, it sounds fascinating. I mean, how long did it take you to do six volumes? So time frame is kind of hard to explain because I started this a long time ago, but I had big, big gaps of time in between um, certain parts of it. Like I, I got divorced, and so that put it on hold for like a year and a half, two years. Right. Um, when I started the first book, uh, I eventually made some connections with a, a couple of small independent publishers that hired me, quote unquote, hired me to do some work for them. And because I wanted to put my best foot forward, I put the stupid fan comic aside for a year. So I've been working on this for 15 years. But each volume, if I'm taking about, if I'm doing nothing but working on it, it takes one year to create one volume. Okay. You know, a drawing you about 80 pages. So yeah, that, I mean, that's about what my, I guess that's a, that's actually probably more than my output now that I think about it. Yeah. It's, it's just in between having to work a regular job and live life. And, you know, when I get my children on the weekends that I get them and that type of stuff, I do have a lot of free time because I'm just a single guy now working on my own stuff, but it's the best I can do. And if I could put one of these out once a year, so I, you know, six years to create six volumes of these books that are, you know, pretty thick. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the best pace I can come up with, but also my, I could, I could make them smaller, but 
part of my interest is to, when I give somebody a book, if they're going to spend time to read my stuff, I want to give them something that's a worthwhile reading experience. It's not just 20 pages of a book. You get 120 pages of a book. You get a significant chunk of a story. I want it to make it worth people's time. Yeah. It's what I would want. I, I, I factor that in. What would I want? I'd like a big, giant book full of a ton of story. And that's what I'm doing. So that's why that's why I do what I do and why it takes me so long. I could put out more frequently if I did a 20 page book or something like that, but I'd rather give somebody a big graphic novel. Well, what what I'm starting to think now is, you know, I mean, when you think about it, it take it takes the same amount of time to, you know, mail. Sorry, that's my cat in the background. If you hear that <laughs> like noise. Hey, cut it out. Sorry. I mean, it takes the same amount of time to like put a 20 page book in a Gemini mailer, wrap it up, drive it to the post office as it does like an 80 page book. So, I mean, we're kind of better off selling like these bigger books, right? I think so. And the cost of my book is a little bit less expensive being just black and white. I can't color but I also can't afford to pay a person to color such a big book. So I'm going black and white. So it keeps the cost of printing it down. And then, so it, therefore it keeps the cost of getting it to somebody in their hands down because printing a color book would be a lot more expensive. So it's, it's working, you know, it maybe there's better approach to it, but it's what I'm doing. I'm almost done. <laughs> you know, I'm like, some people are like, you should stop doing this and do something else. I'm like, no, I'm too close to the end. I'm halfway <laughs> through book six. I'm approaching the penultimate storyline, the ultimate culmination of everything. I'm so excited to draw. I have to finish this. I have to. I'm like, I hope I don't have a heart attack in the middle of the night. I don't finish it. Like, let me finish this book first, please. So have you ever tried, you know, talking to anybody? I mean, from, uh, is, is the current, the current one is through what, Dynamite? Or is it through Image? I can't remember. The current what? I'm sorry. The current Masters of the Universe comic book. I don't think anything's through Image. I'm, I'm not sure who it would be, but I'm pretty sure it's not them. But um, so what's your question? My question was like, have you ever talked to anybody like, hey, you know, I put a lot of work into this. Would you... Uh, think about publishing this. I it's never honestly crossed my mind in a serious way. I couldn't imagine anybody would be like, "Oh, really? Um, sure, kid." Uh, and and part of the problem is that volumes one through three cross over with Thundercats and Transformers right. as major characters. So it's not just He Man; it's got other parts in there. So that cr creates a difficult thing. The one thing that I've kind of thought about is somebody suggested like take and alter the costume designs just a little bit and change the names and just make it your own. I like, think that's what, that's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. That's feasible. So I just, I want to get it done. And then from there, I'll look at my options, but um, I'm kind of excited to do something else. And I don't know if you've seen how I'm, I've been working. I've been fortunate enough to work with Chuck Gibson. Really? Have you seen me talk about that? Or he's a former, he's a he used to ink for Jim Lee at Wildstorm Studios. Oh, you know what? I have seen seen those. Yeah, um, he just has been watching my channel and he's throwing in great com comments on the ch uh, on different videos I do. And for my birthday, he offered to ink one of my drawings, which came out incredible. It looked so good. Um, and then on my birthday itself. I had put up a video just showing my own pages that I'd finished for this actual book. And he sent me an email. He's like, hey, send me some of those pages. I want to ink it for you. I want to help you on this book. You've inspired me to get back into the game was his words. I'm like, me? I've inspired you because he used to ink comics and he got out of it and he's doing other stuff. But he said he yeah. wants to do some more work while he's still got the physical ability and some fuel in the tank. So he's helping me ink some of these pages. And so there's a possibility once I'm done with this, me and him can stay connected and create something. And part of name recognition, it could be former Wildstorm Comics inker, which would make me stop and look. Right. So that's my kind of hope is that 
he seems interested. We just, I just got, I said, I'm sorry. Cause he was like, do you want to stop working on this and do something together? And I, I had to tell him, I'm like, I really appreciate that. I do, but I have to finish this first. I'm too far into it. I'm too deep. I can't abandon it now. I'm so close to the end. He's like, I understand that. I'll help you get it done. And then we can revisit what we want to do. So I've got some hope for the future. I mean, yeah. I, and uh, I mean, the fact that you did so much work, you know, six volumes of this, I mean, I don't know. I think I would have maybe taken a break and, and, and worked on something else in, in there. But um, like I said, I mean, it, the amount of dedication that you have is is pretty remarkable. Well, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I could have done it, but uh, I, I mean, I, uh, I certainly admire it. Yeah, I, it's one of those things I'm like, I had to prove to myself that I am capable of doing this thing that I want to do. And I've known so many people in my life that talked about what they're going to do. I have all these characters. I have a hundred issue storyline in my head. It's going to be amazing. I'm like, great. Where's page one? You know what? I, I still know a lot of people like that. I mean, like the fact that I now have like, like seven or eight comic books out, I, I get messages on Instagram all the time from people saying like, you know, how do I put together a comic book? And sometimes I'll check in on these people like a year or two later. And they've almost never started working on the comic. Yeah. And that's something that Ed Piscor would talk about. I remember him very specifically on some of his videos. People hit him up like, hey, what's the best printer? What's the best this? What's the best that? He's like, shut up. Make the book. Just make the book and then come to me with these questions. Show me you'll actually do the work first. And then you're, you're worrying about step 452. You haven't done step one. So come back to me when you've made a book. And so I champion that concept all the time. Stop telling me what you're going to do. Show me what you've done. And it's, so I'm trying to like represent my own values. I've made the books. I've done the work. And when I run into somebody like Chuck Gibson, who is for on his own free time for free, helping me work, part of that, that he's dedicating that time to me is because he can see that I'm clearly motivated to work and willing to do the work so i've kind of proven myself to him so it's it's validating as a independent nobody creator like i'm doing a thing and it's i've got something to show for it yeah and like yeah like you said i mean i think regardless of what what it is that you're doing just the fact that you're doing it is important yeah yes sir well, i mean you 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 found a great way to kind of like tie things up, like going back to referencing Ed Piscor. Yep, it's it's a little over an hour. I I think you might want to close the show up right there. Um, thank you for being on the show, Robert. Like I said, I would like to have you on the show again some other time because I mean we kind of got a little bit towards the end in discussing your technique and stuff, but. Um, yeah, I have a hundred questions for you. So yeah, that's, I'd love to do that. And if you ever, you know, you can come on mine one of these times too. We should do this more. I'm all about chatting up, you know, this type of stuff. I'm very interested. So definitely, let's do it. Yeah, I mean, I had stuff that I wanted to work on, but um, I don't know. Just with all the shit that happened today, I just I, I don't yeah know, I feel like doing it. Yep. Um, yeah. So, anyways, Robert, thank you so much. Um, we'll stay in touch. I hope you, the guys in the audience enjoyed this conversation. I don't know how much the people in the audience like knew about Ed Piscor, but um, I don't know. I hope they found it uh, enlightening. I almost said entertaining. It, I hope all the conversation about Ed Piscor wasn't entertaining, but at yeah. the very least, I hope it was enlightening. So thanks everybody for watching again, Robert. Thank you for being on the show. I think we're thank gonna close it out. We will be back again next week. Thank you, sir.